Welcome to another round of overrated or underrated web tech. The three of us, uh, we're web developers and we have opinions on stuff just like most web developers do. And you know what? We all think we're right. So we're going to be talking about <laughs> all of the things that we think we're right about, giving a little bit of overrated or underrated on a few different tech topics. Today, we're talking about Tailwind. We're talking about TypeScript. We're talking about no build tools. We're talking about Docker. So overrated or underrated Tailwind. I don't want to go first because I know like the, I'm the only one saying the, overrated. Uh, what's the Reddit where you have to like vote on if the person sucks or not? Yes, yes. Am I the asshole? Yes. Am I the asshole? Yeah. What I'm going to say here is ESH, which is everyone sucks here. Uh, yeah, I agree. Meaning yeah, that agree. <laughs> the takes on Tailwind are some of the worst takes ever because I feel like either side doesn't take the time to truly understand where it's at because Tailwind has been around for long enough. Enough people use it. Enough smart people have evaluated it and landed on it that it's not. It's clearly not a bad idea. And if yes. you are saying Tailwind is absolutely stupid, it makes a mess of your HTML, I don't think that you actually understand the problems that it is solving. It's probably not my favorite approach, but I certainly understand why so many people love it. And I do use it on many of my projects. Wes, I am shocked we have the same opinion on Tailwind. I don't think I would have under <laughs> like really predicted that. So I agree. And I think uh, what gets misconstrued about me not using Tailwind often is that people think I don't like it or I don't get it. So specifically, the thing that I, I like about Tailwind is that it provides a system. Anytime you have a good system, that system allows you to work in a way that's efficient. It allows you to keep things consistent. Uh, there's a lot of great things about that aspect of Tailwind. The thing yeah. I don't like about it is the authoring experience. For me, it's just not how I like to work. I like the things that it, the features that Tailwind provides. I just solve those exact same issues in several different ways or ways that fit better with my mental model of how I'm thinking things. So people are often like, man, you don't get it. It does this and this and this and that. I know it does those things. Those aren't problems that I have. Like you said, I, I'm solving those problems in a way that I like a little bit better for me. Um, mm -hmm. One of the big reasons about that is, is that like, I don't feel like I want to learn or memorize all of the DSL around Tailwind. For me, I have other systems like open props ingrained in my brain in a way that Tailwind isn't. So like, yeah, I'd much rather pick up the tool that I'm familiar with that solves the same problem in something like open props than mm -hmm. something like Tailwind where I don't know the system. And again, yeah, it's a fine tool for people who want to use it. I, I don't think that's a problem. Just not for me, right? I mean, I, I would say that it is underrated just because of, I guess all the press that it gets. But the, the first thing I have is underrated? just like a missile. Yeah, it's, it's underrated. I think what a lot of people don't realize about Tailwind, but a lot of people who it, like just call it inline styles, like it's just new inline styles, is yeah. the fact that there is a design system. And for me, right. that's probably the what I like the most about it because I was never really consistent about having the same amount of border radius on everything or having the same amount of padding on everything and like being consistent throughout my design. And so one of the things Tailwind helps me with is by having uh, those... those uh, design units. So like when you do uh, P-1, that's not like one pixel of padding. One means a specific number of rims or a specific number of pixels. And one throughout Tailwind, like M-1 or MY-1, that one means the same thing everywhere. So once once you mm -hmm. start to understand what the dash one, the dash two, the, the dash three are, then you're, for me, my designs are more consistent. And that is way different than inline styles because uh, you would just be putting like fixed pixel values or fixed rim values everywhere. And you can solve that same problem with CSS, with CSS variables. And, and like you mentioned, the uh, is it open styles that gives you the open props. variables? Open yeah. props. Open props, open props. Because open props will give you like margin dash one, or I don't know exactly the name of it, but it does a similar thing. And then you can just reuse that variable in all of your CSS. But to me, like comparing the two, it's it, it, it just seems like a lot more work to have to figure out what all those variables are versus just memorizing the dash one and then it just works for everything. Um, so yeah, I think, I think the that's the system, same thing, yeah. CJ. I think memorizing the, the tailwind versus measure, memorizing the variable is the exact same thing. I don't uh, think it is mind. because you're going to have a different variable name for every type of thing. Yeah. With tailwind, H-2 is a height 2, but an M-1 is margin 1. 
Um, on okay. every single project too. There's some yeah. benefit to Tailwind being a de facto standard yes, in that totally. literally every single project that uses Tailwind uses the same scale. Of course, you could change the colors and you can change the defaults, but you can take a component from one project. And that's, AI is very good at writing Tailwind. Like that's a, a huge benefit to it as well. Overrated or underrated? TypeScript, this should be fun, right? <laughs> yeah, I think it's underrated. Honestly, though, I was a TypeScript denier for the longest time, mainly because a lot of my work is building small prototypes, building small tools. And so very early on, for me, TypeScript would get in the way because like I, I want to write quickly and TypeScript takes longer to write. You have to spend the time thinking about, well, what are the types of the argument of the arguments to this function or what are, what are the properties on this object? Um, and so for the longest time, I was just in JavaScript brain where I wanted everything to be dynamic. As I learned it more, and I think that's the main thing is like there's a learning curve. You really have to settle in, learn learn about like at least the basics of the type system. But now, even all of my side projects, I'm using TypeScript. And it's really just like the simplest things. The fact that it'll simply remind me that like, oh, that property doesn't exist or oh, that property could yeah. be undefined. It's all these things that you just weren't thinking about before when you're writing it just with JavaScript. But now you get it part of your developer experience. So yeah, I think it's underrated. I, I think so too. It Anybody who says you should just write straight up JavaScript without writing types, I don't think understands the, the benefits that you get from it. You know, like a lot of people you hear the the constant arguments of it's uh, yeah all this extra time. I'm spending so much time fighting it. And it's like, well, mm -hmm. if you're fighting it, it means your code base probably stinks because <laughs> uh, uh, like, there's issues of course, there, yeah. there's going to be, be problems, but the extra little bit of time that you spend on that, you will get back in development experience as well as the potential bugs. I cannot tell you when I converted, I don't know, three or four years ago when I my code base is over to TypeScript, I cannot tell you how many little edge cases I found that was like, ooh, didn't think about that. You know, that would have been a, a crash right there. Yeah, TypeScript made me realize how bad I was at uh, protecting myself from potential issues in code. You know, Sentry loves people like me uh, before I wrote TypeScript, for sure, because uh, what, Sentry is just going to be getting all those so-and-so is not defined errors or all the things that, that TypeScript prevents you to get. But, you know, for me personally, I agree 100% uh, with both of you is that I do think it's underrated. I do think people who have held out on TypeScript or try to refuse it or whatever, I, I just don't, you know, like... I just don't see writing code and being productive today the same way that I did before I wrote TypeScript. 100% of the time that I fight with TypeScript is when I'm working on library code and I'm having to do some crazy generics and all sorts of manipulating of types. And that's when I hate TypeScript, when I'm doing an authoring experience on a library or uh, something bigger than that. But for the most part, man, it, uh, it saves me a lot of time, and I, I do, I'm a big yeah. fan. All right, next one. Overrated or underrated? No build tools. Wes. Yes, this, no, this not no build option. tools, but like, like no build, meaning that you ship raw CSS and JavaScript ESM modules right to the browser as you author it. So there's no build step in between. Yeah. So I guess that's what you mean, no build tools no build ding tools <laughs> no building tools no no tools just uh yes just hammer it out with uh i guess those are still tools we all use tools doing, since doing we were, yeah i would love absolutely love to live in a world where we have no build tools um, in a world i would love to live in a world where you publish the typescript you author you publish to npm you npm install that and you ship it out david heineman he sorry David, I'm uh, oh, sorry, DHH, or else guy, he's, he's big on this. Brian LaRue, big on this. It can happen, and I would love it because I am so tired of these obtuse build bundle errors that gives you no information about where the actual authoring experience is. But that said, I want to use JSX. I want to import CSS into my JavaScript, although we are we are getting that in, in raw JavaScript. I want to use TypeScript. So I, not there yet. I would love maybe. And I don't know if we'll ever reach that world, but I sure hope so. You know what I never want to have to do ever again 
is figure out the process of uh, authoring a library that works well in all contexts with TypeScript and ships things the right way. Because the Svelte, uh, Svelte kit has like a package, a uh, built-in Svelte package that like does it all for you. But I was trying to publish just a straight up TypeScript package the other day. And I think I had to uh, publish it to NPM maybe 15 times before yeah. when I if, when I installed it and everything worked. It was types. like, yeah, and it would work in dev and then I'd go to build in production. It couldn't find files. Yeah, I, I get it. I. I I think the build tools that are the best are the most transparent ones, um, like Parcel and even Vite. You know, I, I think there are obviously build tools that can be heavier, bigger things, but the ones that function more like, oh, I, don't mind me, I'm just uh, doing some work back here. You know, uh, those are the ones that I, I like. <laughs> I, we're all just we're all building different kinds of websites, right? And so I think the the idea of building a site with no build process at all would be especially crazy for just like even like medium sized websites. Like if you think about, okay, I'm writing raw HTML, CSS and JavaScript and I have multiple pages, there's going to be some copy pasting involved there. Or you're going to have to bring in a JavaScript, li like a JavaScript temp templating library. Um, I guess I don't know if the argument also is like we're not using frameworks either. Because like technically you could use like Vue.js without a build tool. You technically could use React without a build tool, but you can't use JSX unless you add the JSX runtime. Um, and like then the, in the browser. Yeah. So like it's, it's possible, but I think then you're just loading even more JavaScript. So yeah, the thing I can't get over is like in any medium sized code base, you have things that are reusable and on multiple pages and without being able to write the code that could eventually be bundled and minified and, and optimized, you're going to have a bunch of copy pasted stuff. So you're going to end up writing a bunch of extra code. It's not going to be as fast. It's going to be larger files. Um, so I think it could work, I think for simple websites, but I think anything beyond that, and especially like working on a team, like the whole build ecosystem and front end frameworks, like they help with collaboration and, and sharing of code and working on larger teams, uh, because you can, you can write in components and like two different developers could be working on different components and then come back together later. Or like you can have reusable things and reusable code styles and stuff like that in your code base which you, it's just so much harder to get if you don't have any sort of build process. Yeah, if you go to hey.com and view source, that's a good example of they're simply just importing, using ESM modules, importing yeah. the JavaScript that they need. But mm. yeah, they import everything. And it's fine for them because they do not ship boatloads of JavaScript. They do almost everything server side. And mm. then they just, they take the JavaScript sprinkles approach where you need to load the pieces that you need on the page that you need. And and you could do that. Like if you have a heavy like mapping application, mm -hmm. you just put the script tag for the map in on that page and then it just imports it to dependencies from there. Okay, next one. Overrated or underrated? Docker. Guys, uh Docker for development specifically. I've always used Docker a lot in a like a Synology context. I want to throw an MB server on there. I'm loading it up in Docker. But what I'm mm -hmm. not doing is using Docker in my development flow. And I really feel like that's a problem for me. At pain in the ass. I <laughs> everyone always tells me, use Docker, use Docker, use Docker. Freaking the images are way too big. Too you big. gotta run all these random ass commands, you gotta map all your ports. And it's not a skill issue. I have probably 11 Docker images running on my servers. Docker for servers, yes. Docker for development, no chance. I, I can switch my node versions if I need to. I can spin up uh, MySQL if yeah. I need it. I, I don't think it's worth it. And I know, I'm curious, CJ, you are yeah. a big Docker guy. Yeah, I mean, I even, I added Docker to the Syntax website because... Scott had all these weird custom things for MySQL. And so like, if I wanted to get running locally, I would have had custom to install things. MySQL and <laughs> what, what do you say? A custom things, I'm curious. Well, you had like the, the you had the script that like preloads the database. Yeah, a bunch and of then... random Rust code it, that didn't run. Preheats the database, but, it preheated the database. <laughs> <laughs> but rega regardless, if, 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 if you're following the onboarding for syntax without Docker, it's pretty cumbersome, I think, because you have to install MySQL and everything else. And I think that's, for me, the the, the on-ramp to Docker is only Dockerize things like databases, things that you need in every project, but you can easily spin up, you can easily like like have multiple instances. Because if you have a Postgres installed locally or MySQL installed, installed locally, now you're juggling potentially like database names 
or making sure that you're not or overriding your versions or versions. Right. Yeah. And so that's the other thing is like with Docker, you, you basically get, you can lock that down for every project. Um, and so for me, I think like, uh, if you could, if your site or your, your project is using Postgres or it's using MySQL add a simple Docker container that is just the database. I kind of want to go the, the other side, which is start using like VS code dev containers. Yes. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. Which is like, don't even run. <laughs> I don't like running Docker locally. How about you run nothing locally, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, that's, and that's something I haven't explored, but they're, yeah, they're called dev containers. I think you actually do, maybe we're talking about a different thing, but there is one that does run locally, but everything is inside yeah. the Docker container. So yeah, it, it spins up a Linux machine and then there's an extension inside of VS Code that like SSH, SSHs into that machine. So your dev experience is actually you're working directly inside the container. So it's pretty much mm. just as fast as if you were working locally. I think you were saying about like inside versus outside the de the Docker container is exactly where I get really angry with Docker. Just yeah. let me do my stuff like I do on my local machine. I get it. It's a virtual machine. You can't. It's hard for me to pick up a, a new new tool, a new tool like Docker and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, get used to that flow of working. Um, ultimately, what I need is to pair program with CJ for a week and figure out exactly like a good <laughs> flow for me. Did I tell yeah. you I almost got sued by Docker? No, what happened? No, this is a good story. <laughs> so, Let's go. Let's go. Uh, in 2015 or 20, maybe even no, 20, 2013, uh, I created a Docker font awesome icon because at the time font mm -hmm. awesome didn't have a Docker icon. So I just went and made one and I published it to, to GitHub. And, uh, and like a year and a half later, their lawyers came knocking uh, and sent me like a very aggressive cease and desist to take it down. And, and I was just like, what the hell's going on? Like we, we, I was working on a website that needed a Docker icon at the time. And it was just a classic, like the lawyers are trying to protect their brand. You know, you know how that happens. So, oh, so, I know uh, how that happens. Did the old tweet about it and, uh, it was a big hubbub and then it, it, somebody who knows what's going on figured it out and then I had to sign some thing. I had to put a license in the repo. Uh, if you search West Boss font awesome Docker icon, it, it shows up. And then they sent me a whole box full of Docker swag as a sorry, oh, wow. we almost sued you. <laughs> All right, that's it. Thanks for tuning in. Let us know if you disagree with any of them, especially if we are wrong on any of these. If you want to watch us compete in any more of it, we got a link right here, right over my finger. And there's some pretty fun stuff. Facebook, how much does Facebook spend on data every single day? $30 million domain name, all kinds of fun stuff. Yeah, and we also are trying to get to 500,000 subs. So there was a comment on a video recently and Wes responded, if we get to 500,000 subs, he'll switch to NeoVim for a month. And Scott and I decided we are going to join him as well. So subscribe. S smash it. <laughs>